Yes, sir. Yeah, just uh, give me the countdown. We are going live in five, four, three, two, one. We are live now. Good evening and warm welcome to the 39th session of Pediatric Orthopedic Active Learning Session. I am Dhiran Ganjwala, the coordinator for these sessions. And we invite eminent experts of pediatric orthopedic so that our fellows can learn from there firsthand. The topic for today's session is basics of adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. And the reason we started with this basic topic is most of the high volume pediatric orthopedic centers in India, they don't have a specialized unit or they are not focusing on pediatric spine. So our fellows have a very little exposure to pediatric spine. And today we are very fortunate to have an expert with us, Dr. Jennifer Ball. She is the director of pediatric spine at Seattle Children's Hospital. She is associate professor at University of Washington. She is the director of pediatric orthopedic surgery fellowship. And she is well known for her teaching skill and mentoring mindset. Um, Just yeah, before coming yeah, yeah. for this lecture, she took one class of their uh, residence. So she is really committed to the teaching. She had a vast experience of uh, treating variety of pediatric spine conditions. And she had a wonderful training, like uh, she had a fellowship at Alfred DuPont Hospital for Children. Her clinical practice is focused on all aspects of pediatric spine deformity. And in addition to practice, she is in a leadership role at POSNA as well as Scoliosis Research, Research Society. If you have a questions, those who have joined the meeting, they can ask in the chat. Uh, box and those who are watching it live, they can send me the questions in the form of WhatsApp message on a number. Please note down the number. The WhatsApp number is 97129-25600. I repeat, 97129-25600. With that uh, short introduction, now, now I invite uh, Jennifer to uh, share his exp her experience with us. Over to you, Jennifer. Thank you so much for having me. <clears throat> I'm more than happy to answer any questions as they come. So I'll try to give some pauses here to give an opportunity to cover those. Today, I'm going to go over some basics of adolescent idiopathic scoliosis and, and all of the, we'll touch on all the scoliosis types. And mainly we're going to be focusing on some non-operative treatment uh, and when we should take someone uh, to the operating room. There's some other specifics that we can talk about another time, uh, or we'll see what time we have left here and what interest there is about more surgical treatment. When we talk about scoliosis, we kind of think about them in these two main categories. Is it idiopathic scoliosis or non-idiopathic scoliosis? Idiopathic scoliosis just means that we haven't figured out what the cause of it is yet. We have a lot of different um, theories that are being researched right now, whether it's the microcilia, what does it have to do with the disc, the discoligamentous complex and the way that that starts to change in rapid growth and whether it's stabilized or not. So there's a lot of different um, theories and reasons that someone might have an idiopathic scoliosis, but there's probably some combination of genes that's that's leading to that. This is compared to non-idiopathic scoliosis, where we can actually decide that, oh, this, there's a reason for this scoliosis. Do they have um, uh, NF? Therefore, be, it's syndromic. Do they have um, cerebral palsy, GMFCS5, neuromuscular scoliosis? Is it congenital? Are they just born with a different shape? Uh, it, did they have a heart surgery at a young age that's now affecting the way that their spine is growing? So we're talking about really the causes that we just don't quite know about yet, the idiopathic. There's also a complete temporal thought to this as well. So you can have an early onset idiopathic scoliosis. You can have an early onset non-idiopathic scoliosis as well. And these are scolioses that show up before the age of 10. The treatment thought for each of these three different categories is different. For idiopathic scoliosis, our goals here today are to try to talk about how can we stop the progression before they become adults? Because growth is a major driver, driver for the worsening of the curve. We also treat it to avoid potential respiratory problems in the future. 
For non-idiopathic scoliosis, you really want to make sure you know what the diagnosis is so that you can understand what the natural history of that scoliosis may be. And for those patients, similar to idiopathic scoliosis, we care about their pulmonary function, but we're also often trying to improve just their daily function and interaction. Then again, you're going to hear this commonly, this, this need for pulmonary protection it's never more important than in the early onset patients. So there you're really trying to think again about their respiratory function. So today we're really just gonna be focusing on adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. This is a scoliosis that turns uh, that shows up over the age of 10. Most people think about it as this curve of the spine when you look at it in the coronal plane, but really we need to focus on it being a three-dimensional deformity. So in the sagittal plane, there's hypokyphosis, and in the axial plane, there's rotation. And it's these aspects of the three-dimensional planes that give us what we see on an exam. So if someone comes to see you uh, with idiopathic scoliosis or with some sort of scoliosis, your very first thing is going to be to do an exam. The key part of the exam is, of course, making sure their motor and sensory neurologic function is all normal their gait and their arches should be symmetric. They should have normal reflexes. I found many different uh, aspects of, uh, many different diagnoses that we thought were idiopathic scoliosis just at this stage alone. I've seen asymmetric um, arches and found a spinal cord tumor. I've seen asymmetric reflexes or hyperreflexia uh, and found uh, syrinxes or chiaris or other problems. You look at their shoulder and pelvic height, you can have leg length difference, and that could lead to a, what looks like a lumbar scoliosis, but you put their feet on blocks to make them even, and maybe that scoliosis goes away. You want to look at their sagittal alignment. Idiopathic scoliosis, as we said, is hypokyphotic. If they have a lot of kyphosis, then that might not be idiopathic scoliosis. And then here's the key, this Adams forward bend test. We have the patients bend over, just let their arms and head dangle down towards their toes and see where the asymmetry is on their back and if there is any. Sometimes you can be thrown off and there can be some asymmetry just in the rib cage, but you can use a scoliometer like this. Um, I don't know if this is something that uh, is commonly used uh, where you all are, but you can also just eye it. There's some other ways to do it as well, but if the scoliometer is anywhere between five and seven degrees, that's one that we think is probably a cob angle or a curve of at least 20 degrees and usually one that we'll want to have sent to us. So most in the US, a lot of the pediatricians will do this initial examination when they see their patients each year. And then if there's an abnormality, come to see us. Um, so for us, we consider the, uh, our um, various societies, the Scoliosis Research Society, the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of North America, and the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons have determined that a, a scoliometer greater than five to seven degrees is considered a positive screen, and these patients should be sent to an orthopedic surgeon. Now, there are problems with this because a larger body mass will hide this, so we're much more likely to miss it with a larger body habitus. So if it's three degrees with a larger body habitus, maybe that's someone that we should be seeing. Um, or, or at least by five degrees. There's many of st different studies also of various different scoliometers, different iPhone apps that you might be able to use to do this. I found over 16 studies recently just talking about different scoliometers. So we know it's not a perfect system, but uh, no screening really is, but that's how you might wanna do your initial screening. Next, of course, to, to truly figure this out, you're gonna need a radiograph to measure a Cobb angle. But when do you need to get an MRI? I get an MRI when I think that there might not be an idiopathic scoliosis. So anything abnormal on their clinical presentation, do they have a lot of pain associated with it? Did the curve suddenly show up? A month ago it wasn't there and now it's here. I saw that just recently in our emergency room, someone came in, they swore that this curve had not been there. Sometimes we just can't see it. Um, maybe the patient wears more modest clothing, but sometimes there's truly a brand new curve. That brand new curve might be that there is an osteomyelitis uh, or, or a disc herniation that's causing the patient to move away from that. 
So that's not going to be idiopathic. You might find that on an MRI. Basal skull headaches. That might make me worried about a Chiari that's forming this. And then most people here uh, in the United States, any curve over 25 degrees in a patient less than 10 degrees, less than 10 years old, I'm sorry, we consider an early onset scoliosis and a third of those patients will have something on an MRI that is concerning that might point to a non-idiopathic diagnosis. Abnormal exam, we touched on these already. Reflexes, arch, arches, really stiff, not moving well, kyphotic. And then an abnormal radiograph. These curves aren't usually very short and sharp, meaning they occur over more than four or five segments. We don't usually see kyphosis. And the curve itself is always associated with some rotation. So if we see a curve that doesn't have rotation, that might throw us off. Here is an example. This is a 14-year-old with a sizable curve, 78 degrees. <clears throat> More impressive to me, though, is that there's some kyphosis with this curve, which I wouldn't expect. And I would call this a fairly short and sharp curve. The combination of the kyphosis and um, that short, sharp curve, we get some bending films, it's pretty stiff. That makes me worry that maybe this isn't an idiopathic scoliosis. So first we get an MRI. And this is what we see, which of course is a Chiari malformation. You can see the cerebellum and the, the uh, tonsils coming distal uh, to the edge of the skull. So first this needs to be treated before we can then uh, approach the scoliosis. Here's another example. This is a 12 year old, 31 degree curve, not very big, but a decent size. If you look at the pedicles, along the vertebral bodies, you can see that they're not very rotated. I would expect a little bit more rotation at the apex and this 30 degree curve. I would also expect more balance. So instead of this slow C-shaped sloping curve, I would expect it to be more S-shaped, to be a little bit more balanced. So for this patient, I'm gonna go ahead uh, and get an MRI as well on that MRI. You can see some increased T2 signal within a portion of the bone that makes me concerned for at least some sort of an inflammatory reactive process. This I'm actually considering as I'm suspecting something very particular. And when I get a CT that's confirmed, you can see this is an osteoid osteoma. Um, so just the treatment of the osteoid osteoma will correct this scoliosis. Here's another example of when I might get an MRI. This looks like a fairly normal curve to me. It's six months. These radiographs were taken six, I'm sorry, this is a 13 year old. This radiograph was taken six months ago. She finally made it into my clinic. I take another x-ray when I see her. Now her curve looks like this. In six months, her curve went from 60 degrees to 120 degrees. This to me is a rapid progression. I'm going to get an MRI on this just to make sure there's nothing we're missing. There was nothing that we were missing. She just happened to have a very rapid growth spurt with already a big curve. And this was just an idiopathic scoliosis that we treated. One more patient, small little curve, but already 18 years old. So not usually one we have to worry about, but we know we didn't have this curve recent. Uh, um, at an earlier time point, pretty recently. So he just noticed this. And if you zoom in on the lumbosacral junction, you'll see he actually has a high grade spondylolisthesis. So he's kind of just moving away from what's a, a pain point, And that's what's giving him his scoliosis. Um, so you really have to make sure before we say, all right, it's idiopathic scoliosis, how do we treat it? Let's really make sure it's idiopathic scoliosis. So now that we've made sure it's idiopathic scoliosis, how do we treat it? There's two main points that matter. One, what is the patient's maturity? Because what we wanna know is how much more growth do they have left? If they have a lot of growth left, the curve's gonna get a lot bigger. If they have no growth left, the curve might not get any bigger. The best ways that we can decide what a patient's maturity is, is by looking at radiographs and looking at their growth plates. We used to really rely on the RISR score, which is on the left here. Um, and that's a cap of bone uh, that you will see form first out lateral and then work its way medial and then fuse down. This doesn't correlate as well 
to a scoliosis um, because it doesn't correlate as well to the growth plates in the spine. But we know that the growth plates in the hand correlate better. So now we, we here rely on the Sander score, which you can see here at right. And that talks about um, how the hand growth plates mature and how that correlates to the phases of growth in the spine. And we know that the most rapid phase of growth is at Sanders three, and the growth plates close from the tips of the fingers proximal. And so at this point, at stage three, we know they have very rapid growth. At stage four, we know they're coming out of their rapid growth. And then five, six, seven, they're really slowing down. One and two, it's even before their major growth spurt. So we rely heavily on these factors. I do want to pause here and make sure that there weren't questions at this point on just normal exam, odd radiographs, and how to assess uh, a patient's skeletal maturity. Good? All right. So this skeletal maturity is going to, um, again, tell us about their growth. This chart on the left talks about how they're growing and it overlies that RIS or HIP score on it. So their peak velocity happens before we start to see that cap, actually. And so because of that, that's also why the hand works a little bit better. This is where you can see the triradiate closure. So their peak height velocity happens just before their triradiates close. Uh, and it also happens, usually I would say about six months, depending on their body habitus, prior to their first menarche. So those are all, uh, very, if they're females, those are all important information that we're gathering when we're seeing them. So the patient maturity helps to tell us how much growth remaining there is. And then the only other thing that matters is how big is the curve? And we put the two of those together to decide how to treat them. The most basic way that we treat someone is with bracing. So textbook indications for bracing, 25 to 40 degrees, is there zero, one, or two. For me, this includes Sanders five, zero to five on a Sanders score. I'm probably not gonna brace a six. Um, the patients we wouldn't use a brace in if they have respiratory issues. If they have very severe lordosis, it's very hard to brace. If it's a rigid curve over 40 degrees, they simply don't tolerate the brace very well. And the writing may be on the wall that we're reaching um, where we would most likely consider surgery, which is at a 50 degrees uh, number. And if the apex of the curve is at T8, we really can't treat it very well. We need a three-point push on our TLSO cast, just like you would a distal radius fracture or a both bone forearm fracture. And so you need to get beyond that fracture point on either side of it and hit the fracture point. So think of the apex of the curve as the fracture point. You need to be able to push above and below and at that point. And so if the curve is above T8, it's pretty hard to push above it since your shoulder and your arm is there. So a high curve is a hard one to brace. And the purpose of the brace is to prevent progression, prevent the need for surgery, but we explained to the family that it standardly does not improve the curve. There are some caveats I'll talk about in a second. Um, the So in general, basic teaching, TLSO, if the curve is over 25 degrees, and the riser is two or below. So thoracal lumbar, um, sacral orthosis, TLSO brace. This is the landmark study, the braced trial that taught us about this bracing and what the dose effect was for how many hours. So if you wear a brace down here on the right for at least uh, 18 hours, you will be, the patients in this trial were 90% successful at avoiding the need for surgery. These were mostly very basic TLSOs called Boston TLSOs or uh, Wilmington TLSOs. Now we have a more advanced uh, or at least a newer TLSO, uh, a Wood Rigo Cheneau or a Rigo Cheneau, a WRC brace. Um, and so there's been a number of comparisons between these braces and the old braces to figure out if they are um, uh, better to use. There are some studies that do promote the use of this uh, WRC brace, which really focuses more on holding rotation for these patients. This is one of the main studies that people point to, but it was just a trial of 13 versus 95. It was retrospective. 
So there are some race, some curves that do better in a Rigo Chenot brace and some that do worse because it really pushes up a shoulder. So if you have a high thoracic curve uh, on top of a major main thoracic curve, that might do worse in a, in a Rigo Chenot brace as well. So there are some, some cases that we're starting to use different braces for, including a nighttime brace. Um, so this is a study uh, that now is looking at uh, various nighttime braces versus daytime braces. And the nighttime braces over accentuate the curve. So a smaller amount of time, but a larger force, and maybe that's enough. And right now we're really working on some randomized controlled trials. I'm uh, um, involved in two of these studies uh, to try to figure out what this answer might be. So is this the end all and be all though? TLSO greater than 25 degrees, RIS are less than two? Well, maybe not quite. Even just this year at our POSNA Pediatric Orthopedic Society meeting, this study, which is not yet published, looked at bracing curves that are 15 degrees and showed an improvement in their curve size. So whereas before we we're saying just brace um, to see if you uh, you should be um, uh, putting someone in a brace and, and wait until they're 25 degrees. Now this is suggesting we should actually be bracing at 15 degrees and we might improve their brace particularly if they're younger. Another study um, looked at when to stop the braces. So we know uh, in the past we stop when we're at sand or seven, which means all of the hand growth plates are done and there's a, the wrist growth place is still open. Uh, other things that help, have they not grown in the last two visits? Are they at least RIS or four? Are they at least two years past their first menarche if they're a females? But now we know that even if these are closed, they can still have some growth and progression. So now we're really looking at Sanders B, 7B. So I don't stop a brace now until the ulna is closed as well. The other kind of tried and true thought and teaching is, well, our whole point of wearing these braces and putting these patients in, in these braces is to keep the curve from progressing until they're done growing. So if we can keep a small curve and then they'll be done growing, we just tell them they're good. They don't need to come back anymore. We're all set. Brace, be done growing, stop the brace, you're good. But now, unfortunately, we have some newer studies that are much longer out, um, 40 years down the line, that show us even curves that are as small as 30 degrees, unfortunately, continue to progress as well. Not a lot, but there are some that over the course of 40 years progress 20 degrees um, on average, even at just 30, 35 degrees. So that is certainly concerning. And we also know that the health-related quality of life scores may be lower than we think at these points 40 degrees later. So what else can we do besides bracing? There's Schroth physical therapy, which has become more popular over the last uh, probably decade here in the United States. And this is a physical therapy that focuses on learning how to hold their curves open and in a corrected position and strengthening the muscles that allow them to do that. Um, we see that uh, perhaps the best study shows that maybe this prevents a progression of at least one degree per year. And, and uh, kind of what does that look like for patients and how well do they do with those things? Um, depends also on their age, the flexibility of their curve, if they're also using a brace. Certainly we do this not as a standalone treatment. Patients should be in braces first and foremost, and then we offer Schroth physical therapy additionally. I see two sh chats up here in the chat box. Are these questions? I don't know if I'll bring this over here. I'll just take a minute and address these. What radiographs do I routinely order in our clinic? Um, so if it's a first time visit for a patient, I'm going to get just a standing two view AP and lateral radiograph because I want to make sure that there's not uh, an odd sagittal alignment that will make me want to get an MRI. I do not get a traction film right away. I only get a traction film when I start to think about a surgery and which levels to choose for a surgery. Um, I can feel a little bit in the exam of how flexible their curve is, uh, but really I want to see how they move. If they can bend down and touch their toes, I'm not worried about how stiff the curve is necessarily 
to trigger me to say, wow, this is a really stiff curve. We should get an MRI. Um, that isn't a trigger for me. So that's why I don't get a uh, traction film when I see them or as I follow them along. Only at their last visit right before surgery do I get a traction film. And in these patients, I'll do bending films usually side to side as their traction film, unless their curve is over 90 degrees. Then I do a supine traction film because they can't bend very well over a 90 degree curve. Uh, and then, uh, no, great, great question. At what age would we brace a 15 degree curve? Very important. So we're still thinking about their growth potential and their curve size. So we still have to put both of these together. Uh, someone who is a riser, uh, you know, three or four, definitely I'm not going to be bracing um, no matter what size their, cur their curves are. Um, a 15 degree curve at a very young patient is a great curve to brace. Um, a 15 degree curve while they're getting close to being out of their growth spurt, I'm not going to brace or we're at least going to have a conversation. Are they um, Sanders four where normally I would brace a 35 degree curve? Maybe we have a conversation. What is it worth to them at 15? Do they want to see it get to 20 or 25 before? So definitely on the younger side is a, is a smaller uh, curve. Uh, Okay. Jen, yeah, I have a question. Like uh, we know that uh, scoliosis, AIS is basically three plane deformity. Now, what is the proportion of the uh, components? So like say, if you look at the uh, AP view uh, versus the rotation, is there any linkage between the two? You mentioned that when it's more than five to seven degree, that suggests that it's more than the Cobb's angle is more than 20. So it's three times the rotation. Uh, that ratio remains same all throughout or it varies with the time? We do see a, a linear re, uh, relation, but it's not a perfect linear uh, relation. Some people do have more um, rotation than others. Uh, and certainly because of that Cobb angle, that's a challenge. The only way to really know is to get a 3D EO scan um, of these patients to do it. And they've they've done that to show the linear aspect of it. And there are a few equations that help um, connect the, the linear aspect of it. Um, but it's not a it's not a one to one and it's not a three X to, to one either. So um, it's a more complicated uh, equation that you have to compute. Good question. But certainly it's linear enough that you should think a big curve should have more rotation. And so if those two things are off, there might be something else going on. Um, so, it, so it still can help guide your understanding. All right, so we've done everything we could for these patients. We brace them, we put them through physical therapy. When do we have to take them to surgery and why? The whole reason that we treat these idiopathic scoliosis patients with surgery is to prevent their pulmonary issues later on. So we take inc incredibly perfect, healthy kids that are running around with a 50 degree curve, and we put them through a major surgery because we wanna avoid a problem later on. We have shown that pulmonary function tests show an obvious decline starting at around 70 degrees, and that's, uh, I've seen it even earlier at about 60 degrees. So that's the whole reason we operate. And again, when do we fuse? Well, we're going to go back to the same thing. What's the size of the curve and how much growth do they have remaining? So when do we not yet operate? A curve between 20 and 45 degrees. That's going to be a brace. Rizzer zero to three. We're bracing them. We're doing trough physical therapy like we just talked about. Because of the brace study, we know we're going to have them do it for 18 hours a day. We're going to stop the brace when it's Sanders 7B. If it's a curve that's 40 to 60 degrees and it bends out to less than 35 degrees so it's a very flexible curve and they're around sanders three so they're still pretty flexible you could either continue with this brace because this fits um, what we talked about until it gets to 50 degrees you know you could brace this um you could wait until the curve gets to 50 degrees hope it doesn't but wait till it gets to 50 degrees and then do a fusion or at this stage, 40 to 60 degrees in a flexible curve and still a lot of growth, you can consider a vertebral body tether. Um, this is obviously newer. It's gotten approval here in the United States now for um, over five years. And so we do have some five-year study data to talk about um, vertebral body tethers. And we'll talk about that in a second, but that's a, a certain type of a surgery. One other reason you might not yet 
um, do a fusion is if it's a big curve, it's over 50 degrees, but they're still really young. So they have an open triradiate cartilage. So they're still RISR zero. They haven't even started um, into their growth spurt in any way. Then you might think to do a growth friendly surgery. So I would operate on these patients, but I would do a growing rod, either a traditional growing rod or a magnetically controlled growing rod. These patients with a curve over 50 degrees with still an open triradiate cartilage are not idiopathic scoliosis because they're Triradiate cartilages are going to close, um, you know, kind of around maybe the age of 11-ish, uh, depending on if they're boys or girls. So if they're already 50 degrees, that means they had a greater than 25 degree curve before they were 10 years old, which makes them early onset scoliosis, which is a different conversation and understanding. But what you should take away from this is a curve over 50 degrees is one that will keep getting bigger generally for the rest of their life. If they're still growing, it's definitely going to get a lot bigger. So you have to do something about it. If they're done growing, it's probably going to get slowly bigger. So you talk about doing something about it um, because of the effect of their lungs decades later. Um, so that's really what uh, idiopathic uh, scoliosis treatment boils down to. So when we do operate, we're talking about the patient's maturity and their curve size. Again, it always comes back to this. So if somebody is done growing, but they have a curve over 50 degrees, and it's shown that it's gonna be one of the majority of the curves over 50 degrees that keeps getting bigger, we'll operate, we'll do a posterior spinal fusion. If they're smaller, uh, I'm sorry, if they're younger still, but beyond their major growth spurt, so Sanders four or higher, Rizzer three or four, and a curve over 50 degrees, that's an operation, that's something we'll, op we'll offer a posterior spinal fusion, whether they've had progression uh, or not, because we know they still have growth left, so it's going to progress. If they're very young, Sanders less than four, but they still have a closed triradiate, then we can do a fusion, and we can do that even if they're not quite 50 degrees, if they're 45 degrees, because again, they have so much growth left, we want to try to capture this and uh, prevent um, what might become a much larger, worse curve if we continue to wait. Open triradiate, consider a growth-friendly option. So if they still, if they have a curve that's over 40 degrees and they have open triradiate cartilages, they're still going to be growing a lot. Can you do a vertebral body tether because they're 40 to 60 degrees? They're Sanders three. They are a flexible curve, or is it? over 60 degrees, a very big curve, um, stiff, then you're gonna be considering, should I do a growing rod on these or can I get it to the point where the triradiates are closed? We can get it into the category just above that. So now the triradiates are closed. They still have a lot of growth left, but not an extreme amount of growth. Then I can put it over to the posterior spinal fusion category. So there's a lot of different options, but they're kind of all centered around the same thing. Curves of 50 degrees and growth. So just to touch on a little bit on this VBT thought. So this is a very classic. We'll give, go over just a couple more um, cases here. Very classic. Scoliosis. Big curve. Got an MRI to make sure because there's a little bit of kyphosis. Normal MRI. Treated it with a posterior spinal fusion. They're 17. So we don't have to worry about any growth-friendly options. Here's another patient. This girl is 12. You can see she's about a RISR two or three. She has a pretty big curve, fairly imbalanced. We're gonna do our best. She's an athlete. We're gonna do our best to do a, as limited a fusion as possible as we can on her. Um, she gets a posterior fusion. Here's another option, another patient. This girl is 14, but she's RISR zero. Her triradiates are closed and she's a gymnast. She really cares about her range of motion. So she has a curve between 40 and 60. She still has a lot of growth left. It was flexible. It bent out to 35. This is a rare case where I would consider doing a vertebral body tether, which is the screws in the front with a rope across it, and you tighten it down as tight as you can to try to get the concave bones to overgrow and the Huter-Volkman principle, which may or may not actually take place. We're still trying to figure that out. 
um, with true growth modulation. And so she was able to maintain more of her range of motion. She didn't have to stop any part of her uh, or have any effect on her um, gymnastics with a lot of flexibility. This is probably much better applied, I think, in the lumbar spine. So VBT indications, just to touch on this, because this is newer and might not be something as um, known, 40 to 60 degrees. For me, it's Sanders three or four. So they still have a large portion of their big growth spurt remaining and they are flexible to less than 30. Why even do this? Why, why are we introducing this new thing? Um, smaller exposure, faster return to sport, but really what we're doing is we're not fusing their spine. And so we're maintaining more of their range of motion. Why not do it? Well, we have a 25% reoperation rate. We either under uh, tension or we over tension. So the curves grow the opposite direction or they keep growing in the same direction and keep getting bigger and have to be revised to a fusion. Uh, there's other risks factors when you do this approach. Um, the lungs, the kidneys, there's other risks. And there are some arguments that there's little mobility saved. There are studies that show that a thoracic tether compared to a thoracic fusion, if you stop at T12 or L1 and you bend forward to touch your toes, there's no difference with that motion. So perhaps we're not actually saving the motion, particularly in the thoracic spine. But here's a, another example of more commonly when I'm using this, this is a big lumbar curve and a kid who still actually has open triradiate cartilages, he's going to grow a lot. And if I were to have to do a surgery on him, including it now, normally I would say, okay, open triradiates, a lot of growth left, curve over 50 degrees. We're thinking of growth friendly. This is not an idiopathic. This is idiopathic, but it's not adolescent idiopathic, juvenile idiopathic scoliosis. But in this kid, I could perhaps avoid doing groin rods, which would have to go down quite far. And I can do perhaps a shorter approach of just a lumbar tether and see how he does as he grows along. So definitely the vertica is still out on here. Another reason to perhaps use a tether, these are two balanced curves, 60 degrees, triradiates are closed, but RIS are zero. So we're just within that 40 to 60 degrees, but a pretty big curves. And we know that they don't get that much motion perhaps from a thoracic tether. So we could do a hybrid approach where we fuse the thoracic spine, tether the lumbar spine uh, and see how that does while being able to control, decrease the chance of needing a reoperation, but allow them more motion in the lumbar spine. So perhaps this is where um, we're going uh, in the future. These uh, are my partners uh, here at Seattle Children's. There's three, three of us that do spine surgery, uh, Bert Yaze and Scott Yang. Um, and um, these are our emails. We're happy to answer any emails or questions at any point. Um, and I'm happy to continue if there are more questions um, uh, to talk about lanky classification and uh, moving on um, to decide about surgery or take some questions. Yeah, let's uh, take a few questions now. Uh, the question is, uh, the first question is like, uh, when we do a vertebral body tether, what are the chances of having a stress riser effect? Uh, that we see very commonly when uh, we operate on an adult spine, when they carry out a even short segment fusion, the adjacent uh, level stress riser effect is very common. How common that is in AIS surgery, after AIS surgery? Um, there's a number of studies that do look at the AIS study. So if you're fused, it's mostly the disc below that becomes a problem. We don't see a vertebral body fracture or, or um, problems in the bone below because these are usually pretty healthy uh, patients. Um, we actually are also comfortable in these pediatric patients stopping at T12 at what we would consider a junctional point that you might not do in an older population. Um, but these patients do well because they still have good, strong lumbar uh, um, musculature and they're active. And so they don't have a lot of, as long as you contour the rods appropriately and think about their sagittal alignment, we don't see that DJK. But what you do see is the discs below get can have more wear and tear because they're trying to do more motion now and take uh, up the motion that the uh, the fuse levels aren't doing. This, so 
the shorter we can fuse, the better. The more discs we leave, the better, which is why we try, if there's an s shape shirt curve, do everything we can to leave that lumbar curve alone and just do the thoracic curve. Um, or if it is a lumbar curve, we try not to go to L4 and see, do everything we can to stop at L3 instead of L4 so that we leave three discs instead of two discs. We know that if we fuse down to L4 at 10 years, on the x-rays, 25% of the patients will show radiographic arthritic changes already. So we do our best to avoid that. I see another question here. Um, until what age does the tether technique work? So it's a great question and one we don't quite know yet. Um, we've done it too early and we've done it too late. And so we're still trying to find that sweet spot. I think right now the sweet spot, less so age and more the you know growth, Sanders three, um, they will still have their big growth spurt. Uh, so Sanders three is probably their key part. The reason because we're trying to get the other side of the curve to grow out and because probably the tethers all break between two and four years. So you need to harness it during that time and have a durable long lasting effect. And the only way you can have a durable long lasting effect is if you induce some sort of a growth change or a structural change, either in the vertebral body itself, because you're compressing on the growth plates on one side, let the other growth plates grow more, or in the disco ligamentous complex. Can you get, because we know the discs are wedging too. Can you get the discs to wedge back the opposite way or become neutral in a manner that it has stability long-term. So now after they've gone through their big growth spurt, they perhaps have a more stable uh, complex there. You've gotten it into a better position. So even if or when that tether breaks, um, there will be long-term uh, correction. But this is still, uh, you know, I'd say we only have about a five, five-year follow-up. Do you, uh, another question, do you need to do an implant removal? Uh, you don't, <laughs> you just leave it. So even if they break, and, and there's a number of studies to figure out how we can tell if they break because it's a radiolucent um, Dacron rope. Um, it, yeah, this is actually um, what it looks like. Um, that's a model of it. Uh, that, that rope itself will break and you can't quite tell. So there's lots of different things to, to figure out if they've broken. But as long as there's not a progression above, below, or at any point that has gone beyond 50 degrees and become a clinical problem, then it's not something that um, you go after. There's a fair bit of scarring when you do have to go after it. So if the tether breaks very early on and you need to revise the tether, then you'll have to go back in and then a new tether is placed, but they are not removed uh, normally. Yes. Yeah, uh, when this uh, tether uh, breaks, uh, usually the other upper and the lower segments are still fixed. Uh, like say it's holding the five segments, the two segments above and two segments below are still tethered. It's only at one level the tether is broken. Right, so right, right. Will the, effect, will the effect continue or like we lose the effect? You do end up losing the effect at that level. And it tends to be, you know, at the apex is where you have the most tension across it. And so you do see, while you don't see a segmental worsening at the levels between, overall the curve can get worse but not all breaks lead to worsening so um, there's a number of asymptomatic tether breakages either because they've attained the correction they need or um, it doesn't result in a worsening to enough of a degree that it becomes a problem or that it gets to 50 degrees and so because of that um, there is not uh, we don't always have to fix a tether break <clears throat> And uh, what is the difference in the material which we use for the the conventional fixation or the correction and the tether uh, uh, rod material? Um, so the screws are very similar, um, uh, but you don't, so you can do an anterior fusion, right? There used to be a lot of anterior fusions. So you do a very similar approach, but in the screws in the same way. Um, the difference being in the fusion, you would take out the discs and put bone graft inside of that. Here, we're not touching the discs at all. 
Uh, and then it's truly a rope. It is like a shoelace piece of Dacron that you put in it that you tighten up versus putting a solid rod. But then you still just put an end cap screw on the top of it to lock it in. Uh, otherwise, it's all the same. So the only difference of the implant is truly, is it a rod or is it a rope? Yeah, still we have uh, one more question. Can you read that? Uh, I think I, yeah, I you don't answered know that, that I... question. Yeah. I think, yeah, all, all the questions you have answered. Um, I can go over um, how to designate a lanky classification. Um, if yes, we can continue with helpful. that. Yeah. Okay. So the whole point of lanky which is a classification made by uh, Dr. Larry Lenke, is to come up with a way to figure out what levels to fuse. So the real reason to designate a Lenke classification is only if you're about to take someone to surgery <clears throat> and figure out how you want to do a fusion for them. So we'll work through an example. So the first thing you have to do is decide what curve is structural. And a structural criteria you can see in the square box on the bottom left I've outlined. This is the whole lanky classification written out here. First, structural criteria. So is the curve the biggest curve? That's a structural curve. So if we look here, this is the biggest curve here, this 50 degree curve. So that's definitely a structural curve. So that we call a main thoracic curve. That's one of the structural curves. Then. Does the, are any of the other curves over 25 when you try to bend them away? So now we look at a bending film. So if we bent the, the top curve and the bottom curve away, you can see they bend out to 16 and six. So neither of those classify as being a structural curve for that reason. And then you also have to look at the side view. So that takes care of the side bending, but we also have to look to see if there's kyphosis over 20. So unfortunately the numbers are different, but bending less than 25, kyphosis less than 20. At the top at T2 to five, if the kyphosis is over 20, then that top curve, even if it bends out, still counts as a structural curve. And same thing at the thoracolumbar junction, if there's kyphosis there, then the lumbar curve, you still have to count as a structural curve. So we've been able to figure out on this example that right now only this curve is a structural curve. That already gets us a large answer for our Lanky classification. So here in curve type, we'd be looking at a non-structural proximal thoracic curve, a structural main thoracic curve, and then a non-structural lumbar curve. So we already know that this is a Lanky type one. Then there are modifiers. There's a um, lumbar modifier and a sagittal modifier. So what, how we get the letter is by looking then um, here. You can see on this right side over here where you can see the spine drawn out, the lumbar modifier, you draw a line, a center sacral vertebral line straight up the center of the body um, to see what the lumbar curve does at that point. Does it curve outside of that line completely so that that line doesn't touch the lumbar curve or does it line go through a pedicle so that would be a B or does it stay right along that that would be an A. Um, and then we look at the sagittal profile which is just making sure that it has normal sagittal alignment which is between 10 and 14, 10 and 40, I'm sorry, is the thoracic kyphosis between 10 and 40, most of them are, then it's just a lanky um, neutral um, versus less than that would be a negative and more than that is a positive. You probably haven't even seen many of that reported. You usually see a lanky 1C or a lanky 3A. Um, you're not going to see most commonly a 3A plus. Um, so that's not something that's used very commonly. So your main, your main uh, things that you're looking at here, um, again, is the structural curve. Then if you were to take a line straight up here, it would come to the inside of this. So that would be a C modifier. 
if the line came right here along the edge of these pedicles and touched these pedicles at the apex, at this apex here, that would be a B modifier. If the line was right through the center of the apex, that would be an A modifier. So this is a lanky 1C and it's neutral because you can see on the lateral radiograph that it's 21 degrees. So that is what uh, basically helps us figure out how to decide which levels to operate on. And I can briefly go through how we do that. Once you decide which the structural radiographs are, then you decide, start now, just decide, okay, what's the top level we should go to? And this is mostly we're talking about, you know, there's a thoracic curve. The answer is pretty simple. Is the upper thoracic curve structural, meaning it doesn't bend out to less than 25, there's kyphosis of uh, at least 20 degrees? Then you go to T2, that's where you start. If the answer is no, then you look at how the top of T1 is tilted and what the shoulders, how the, those are tilted. If they are tilted down to the right, then you have to go up to T2 because most AIS curves are to the right. And if you straighten out a right curve, it will make the left side go higher. If it's even, then you can go to T3. And if the right side is high, you can go to T4 because it's okay if it sends that left shoulder up. You don't have to put screws into three and two to try to control those shoulders more. Um, and so that's a pretty simple way to figure out how to what level to start at, two, three, or four. There's a little bit more nuance to this, obviously. The bigger the curve, the higher up you want to fuse because the higher you're going to send that shoulder. Uh, the more correction you get, the higher you're going to send that shoulder. Um, and uh, the uh, you kind of have to know how you're going to fuse it, perhaps. And maybe a really low curve, you might stop down at five. But this will uh, be a fine way to treat patients if you think about it this way. Two, three, or four, the upper level. Then we have to decide the lower level. So we've already figured out the upper level. Now we think about the lower level. On the lower level, start by looking at a lateral x-ray. Draw a line up from the back corner of the sacrum parallel to the ground. See where it touches and which vertebral body it bisects or at least touches. So it bisects one, it still is through 12, maybe it touches 11. You do not want to stop proximal to that level because you're going to risk distal junctional kyphosis. Now you turn and look at the AP and you draw another center sacral vertebral line right up the center and you see where this line last touches the spine. It last touches a spine here at L3 or up here at T10. So if you're going to include the lumbar curve, you would decide to stop here at L3. If you thought you could just treat the thoracic curve because the lumbar curve is not that big, then you might stop at T11. So one of these levels. How do you figure out if you include the, the lumbar curve or not? Well, there's three things that matter. So picking the lowest level is a little bit more tricky. Just three more main points here. One, does the curve go to the right right away? Or does it start to go to the left? That's a special modifier. So if it's a lanky one, like our patient main thoracic curve, and an A, so the lumbar curve is straight up the center and not a big curve. Does it go to the right, 1AR, or does it first go a little to the left and then go to the right? If it goes to the right, you want to fuse a little bit longer because you're going to end up being imbalanced if you don't. Another difference is, is the last center sacral vertebral line touching L4? You can see here it's touching L4, not quite touching L3. But we want to cheat to L3 to leave as much levels as we possibly can. We can cheat to L3, even if we're not being touched by it, if the center of the body is within three and a half centimeters of the center sacral vertebral line. If on a bender, this disc reverses, then we know that we can get away with stopping at three. And then the biggest question is probably, those are just two small little differences of when you want to go one one more, one less at, at the what's the last touch line. But the biggest one to probably figure out is 
should you do a selective thoracic fusion, meaning not fuse that lumbar spine? And when can you um, get away with doing that? Then you have to look at what the ratios are between the size of the thoracic curve and the size of the lumbar curve. Is the Cobb angle so that the thoracic curve is at least 1.2 times larger than the lumbar curve? Is the apical vertebral rotation, so how those pedicles are rotated, more in the thoracic spine than the lumbar spine? Is the apical vertebral translation, meaning how far away that curve is from the center of the body, more in the thoracic spine than the lumbar spine? Then for all those reasons, you may be able to leave the lumbar spine alone and do a, a, a thoracic curve. So those are really the basics. Um, we can talk in much more details next time about this or other things. Um, but that's how we start to use the Lanky scale. So when you're hearing the Lanky scale, when you're really reading the Lanky scale, that's kind of a basic intro primer um, to what that's all about. Yeah, excellent. Uh, the last part of the lecture was a bit uh, difficult for us to understand, but yeah, uh, because we are not dealing with uh, uh, adolescent idi idiopathic scoliosis that frequently, um, we, we can understand that it was a bit difficult for us. So well, uh, yeah, just something to, if that piques your interest, then um, something to at least give you some guidelines to read about. If that doesn't, then forget about it. There's a lot of other things to take care of. Yes, exactly. So uh, uh, Professor Hitesh, can you? Yeah. Thank you. Uh... Thank you, Dr. Jennifer, for giving the excellent talk on the basic of uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. You are actually included from the clinical examination to the pulse and how to avoid the pitfall for the adolescent idiopathic scoliosis and reach to the level non-operative operative management. Very important concept for the updating of about VBT. I think it is not, not known for the Indian person because that would be relatively good and a new concept, but yet to see the future is in that because we need to have a good number of complications. We are quite balanced on the selecting about VPT complication as well as the indication, as well as the fusion. Thank you very much for the giving the excellent talk. It would be very important for our fellows for active learning session. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank Thanks you for having me. Yeah, thank you. And like uh, we will again have a second session on either early onset scoliosis or on the congenital scoliosis because that's one area where our fellows are really interested and they see a lot of patients with congenital scoliosis. Yeah, we could definitely do neuromuscular and congenital. That'd be great. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. Thank you once again. Yeah. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Thank you so bye. much. Yeah. Bye.